Outro Cast. Well, Robin, where are you dialing in from? I know Arizona guy lived on Long Island, but where are you at now? Uh, I'm in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, we are performing tonight at the Wichita River Fest. And uh, I'm coming to you live from the Drury Hotel uh, uh, workout gym health center. Yeah. Keeping yeah, it healthy health. for the masses. Yeah. The, those 12, 15,000 people tonight, they're seeing a healthy lead singer. That's right. <laughs> that well, is right. Good well, day to you, Darren. Thank you very much, Robin. Long, 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 long time fan over here because Great. I loved the Jim Blossoms in the early 90s. I loved the records that came since then. And one thing that I'm super curious about is when you kind of realized that this was going to be forever for the rest of your life career. Because I remember there was the detour at the Gas Giants. There's been some side projects, projects along the years. But these days, you're playing the biggest crowds that you ever have, in my opinion. We are. We sell more tickets now than we ever did. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I suppose I came to realize probably about, I don't know, somewhere in the 2000s, which were a grim time for us. Uh, when we reunited in the early 2000s, we had to start like rebuilding our fan base and rebuilding our, our business. And um, we had to do a lot of shitty gigs, <laughs> a lot of, lot of shitty gigs. And it was, uh, it was uh, depressing sometimes. You know, I heard, I heard people ask this question, and it's, it's something you just never, you never want to be asked by your fans. But the people used to come up to me all the time and say, why are you playing here? You know, it's just something you really never want to hear. And, um, but it was sometime in the late 2000s where things started getting slowly better and better for us. Like uh, we started yeah. getting pay, paid more. We started selling more tickets, getting bigger, better festivals. And things started coming around. And then by the time we did uh, the Summerland tour in 2012 mm -hmm. with Everclear, Sugar Ray, um who else was on that um marcy playground and um lit um and we really shined on that on that tour and we we consistently got the best reviews in the local papers and that's kind of when i realized uh we were gonna be able to just keep going for as long as we wanted you know we'd be able to just keep playing and the things were getting better and better and it was also amazing to me on that tour was that we were the most like organized band on the tour you know we, we we'd look at you know, we'd look around and it seemed like we kind of had our shit together and the other bands on that bill seemed to look to us as uh sort of the, the standard and uh at least that's the impression i got and from just from things that they would say to me and yeah. so I guess it was somewhere around 2012 that I, I knew for sure that we were uh, going to be able to just keep going uh, until uh, until we can't anymore. You know? I would have to imagine this point in time and tell me if I'm wrong, that the Jim Blossoms have basically two sets they can do. They have the like, here are the eight to 10 massive hits that, you know, and then you have the 90 to 100 minute Here's the hits, but here's the stuff that we really want to play, and the one or two things from the latest record too. Like you have those two sets. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's a good good way to put it. We also have a third set. If we go to, uh, we do a lot of private parties these days. Yeah. And uh, private, like corporate functions, that sort of thing. Yeah. And we learned uh, we learned several years ago that we need to toss in a bunch of cover songs when we do those things because. When you're playing for a corporate event um, for an audience that maybe didn't even know you were going to be there, uh, you know, at some convention or something, they they want the hits, but they don't want to. It, it's hard to get people, keep people on the dance floor when you're playing songs like Competition Smile <laughs> and, uh, you know, just the B, the B side stuff. So. Several, probably about six years ago, I remember saying to the band, if we're going to do these corporate gigs, we got to we got to toss in some really fun 
cover songs uh, just to keep people on the dance floor. So, um, so we've got a third set where we we have a bunch of covers in there. You know. Does the covers list ever include Christine 16? Because that was a great Letterman appearance that the band had back <laughs> in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. No. Um, uh, and, you know, there's a faction within the band that doesn't like doing cover songs at all. <laughs> and it's, it's, that is extremely bothered by it. Right. And I don't... I don't understand that, uh, you know. I mean, I didn't write every song that we do, right? Um, and certainly, this member of the group, uh, you know, didn't write a whole hell of a lot of the songs. So I asked him once. He's like, "What's the difference to you?" It's like you didn't write any of this material anyway. You know, so why? What's what's the big problem with doing covers? And for whatever reason, he just has this thing. That it's like a a point of pride, personal integrity, wants to play original music only. And he, he gets, he really, really, really hates playing covers. So uh, anyway, you know, you can't, that's just part of being in a band is you got to deal with different opinions, personalities, objectives, you know. Um, we're, we're lucky we've been able to work through most of that stuff and still be together after 35 years, you know. Chalk that up to the Jim Blossoms being one of the most punk rock bands that people don't know is a punk rock band. Because one of the times I interviewed you, I had the pleasure of asking about why you used particular producers. And you admitted, well, there was replacements influenced the whole thing. So yeah. in other words, <laughs> this band putting out this radio friendly stuff, but there's humor and there's attitude behind the whole thing. That's how I always looked at the Jim Blossoms. And one of the reasons I really liked the band. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's that's nice to hear. So with Kiss, was Kiss an influence on the band or at that time was that like a, hey, do you want to do this? And here's an advance and you'll be on TV for the promo tour. Uh, well, for most of the band, that's what it was. It was just a, <laughs> just a promotional opportunity. For me, it was a lifelong dream come true. I I literally would dream about being in KISS when I was like in the sixth grade. I spent my entire, the entire year of the sixth grade in my best friend's basement pretending we were in KISS. Just we would put on KISS records and he would be Peter Chris and I was Paul Stanley and we would just stand at the foot of his bed pretending we were doing KISS shows. And um, so for me, it was a lifelong dream and they were a huge influence on me as a performer, as a songwriter. And um, so when the opportunity came up to participate in the KISS tribute record, I was very enthusiastic and uh, was able to, you know, somewhat easily convince my bandmates to go along with it. And then, you know, I had to look through the catalog to uh, figure out like what song would work for us as a band and, you know, we couldn't really do some of the, you know, more metallic things like uh, Almost Human or God of right. Thunder, <laughs> Firehouse or whatever. You know, we, we had to had to look towards the poppier stuff. And um, Hard Luck Woman was already taken. Right. I think Garth, Garth Brooks did that one on the on the tribute record. So. Yeah, uh, I thought I I suggested Christine sixteen because it's a real pop song, and uh, yeah, we were able to uh, to get that recorded. I spent a a whole day in the studio hanging out with Gene and Paul uh, when we mixed that record, and uh, it was a, it was a huge thrill for me. I got to bring my Kiss lunchbox and get them to sign it, and my best friend from the sixth grade, I brought his copy of Love Gun. And got it autographed, and now that's framed on his on his wall. And I actually I live with him part time when I'm in Arizona. I live with my best friend Paul. All his kids mm -hmm. have moved away, and so now I've got a room at his house. And that uh, autographed copy of Love Gun is there on the wall every time I go down the hallway. Nice. And uh, yeah, I was really really happy that I could make that opportunity you know opportunity for him 
And uh, then I was super proud to go on television with Kiss and front Kiss on Letterman. And I'll tell you, as a musician, when I'm hanging out with other musicians and we're just chatting, uh, you know, if it comes up and I say, I got to front Kiss on Letterman, you know, my my peers go, holy shit, are you serious? You know, like, you, yeah. you, you did what? You know, and so... Uh, a lot of a lot of credibility to be able to say that and it so, goes uh, it goes both yeah. ways I, ha I have to add that half the people i interview play music partially in some way because of kiss and the other half of the people use it as a punching bag kind of band like the other day when i was interviewing the singer of sparta who was in that the drive-in the one band that he uses his punching <laughs> bag out of nowhere unsolicited was Kiss. So you never know if you're going to meet a friend for life because they love Kiss or yeah. you know, the detractor. I mean, Van Halen yeah. is one of those. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I suppose you're right. I mean, some people that, you know, never really were able to get into Kiss, you know, the uh, the whole thing with all the the makeup and just the wacky personalities. And then, you know, the music itself, it's... Uh, you know, a lot of it comes dangerously close to Spinal Tap, like <laughs> parody of rock and roll, you know, and so uh, a lot of people just don't get it. But uh, I've always admired them. They're they're fine craftsmen as songwriters. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're the shrewdest businessmen in the history of the music industry. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, and I love the music. I absolutely love it. You know, another band that people that people don't understand is uh, one of my favorite, favorite bands in the world who I consider one of the greatest rock bands of all time is The Darkness. Oh, and yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people just don't, don't get The Darkness and they think it's some kind of a joke. Um, and it's just, it, nothing could be further from the truth. They're one of the most serious uh, and, uh, uh, and strongest rock bands in history. And um, it's, it, but it's done, some of the music is done very tongue in cheek. Totally. And a lot of people, people can't get it. You know, I mean, uh, I love how fearless they are, you know, and it works for them. I mean, I could never sing, I could never write a song about Vikings and make it work. Or, yeah. you know, these are, these are the kind of songs I was trying to write when I was like in the fifth grade. Songs about, you know, Vikings and UFOs and stuff. Uh, but... Uh, the darkness, they can do that. And then at the same time, they know how to write like a, a universally understood uh, love song or just an anthemic rock tune. Um, there's nobody, nobody better. The darkness. Have you heard his podcast, by the way, before I ask my last yeah. question? The Justin yeah, Hall yeah. I've, yeah, I just, Justin's, Justin's great. He's He's one of my heroes. And... Uh, as a rock singer, I think of him as like uh, an Olympian god. You yeah. know, I um, I usually think that I'm I, I know I'm a pretty good singer, and I I'd like to think I'm somewhere in maybe the top 500 all time greatest rock singers, maybe one of the top 200 living and working rock singers right now. Yeah. Justin is number one, number one living rock singer on planet Earth, living working current rock star. Justin Hawkins. And a lead guitarist on top of that, which, you know, yeah. he needed more to do. But, but, but absolutely. And this and the songwriting vision, you know, just the, the vision of of the uh, of a band leader. Just, you know, so there's none none better. Totally. Well, my last question before I let you go, I'm dialing in from Long Beach, Long Island, New York, near oh, where go I used to live. In... I guess the skies are yellow. Oh, my God. The skies are yellow right now, indeed. And uh, you spent a lot of time in Valley Stream. And when you speak to people who live in Valley Stream, they have their favorite pizza place. The Central, the South, and the North people. Which is your go-to pizza place out there? Well, uh, I still live there in Valley Stream. Um, nice. Uh, yeah, and my, my ex-wife just sent me a picture of the sky. Uh, she, that's where she's from. Um, and yeah, God, it looks, you know, downright apocalyptic. It is spooky right now. Here. So, so uh, you know, my heart goes out to you and everybody else. Thank who's you. Who's dealing with that right now. Um, 
So my favorite pizza place in Valley Stream, without a doubt, is Ancona. Oh. No, that, An -An Ancona. It's spelled A-N-C-O-N-A, -A, Ancona. Uh, it's, on, oh. uh, it's on Rockaway, downtown Valley Stream. Far and away, the, the best, uh, best pizza. And, you know, every other pizza joint in Valley Stream or on Long Island is, is great. You can't throw a rock without hitting a great world-class pizza joint. Totally. Uh, but Ancona stands out. There's something about like uh, their grandma's pie has a sort of a pastry sort of feel to the crust. It's really light and airy, crispy. Um, they use the best pepperonis, those little pepperonis that like curl up into little cups full of grease. Oh, <laughs> so good. Well. So good. And, uh, you know, and it's fun. Uh, the, uh, one of the owners, uh, his name is Wilson. And so every time I walk in, it's like, hey, Mr. Wilson. And I'm like, hey, Mr. Wilson. You know, uh, so I like that place. And then not too far from my house is another place called Genevieve's Pizzeria. And I like Genevieve's. They have a bigger menu, you know, so you can get like lasagna or a chicken parm hero. And um, they deliver. Genevieve's delivers. So I, I, I get them a lot so I don't have to leave the house. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, I uh, you know it took me a long time to become to to really start to enjoy living on Long Island. It wasn't really until the pandemic, uh, and I then I finally met all my neighbors because I spent most of the pandemic sitting on my front steps, smoking pot and drinking, and yeah. Uh, so you know the people come by walking their dogs, and right at the beginning of the pandemic, I would I bought an Arizona flag. And so I'm the only guy on Long Island that flies a Arizona flag from my front porch. And the neighbors would come by walking their dogs and they'd be like, uh, what flag is that? You know, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Arizona, the 48th state, you know, and they're like, Arizona, you know, one guy thought it was like, like a Chinese flag or something. Uh, but it's sad to me because Arizona has got the, maybe the best flag in the country. Uh, it's right up there, one of the best flags. And, you know, most people from New York have not been to Arizona and don't know much about it. But uh, I, I was anyway, just in El Paso. The next time I go to El Paso, we'll go to Arizona. That is a promise. But you're right. Okay. They have not. Yeah. Robin. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've been able to uh, spread the Arizona love a little bit on Long Island. Certainly when I when I first got married in the 90s. My ex-wife, I remember being on the phone with her the first time. And I was I was back in Arizona calling her, you know, trying to woo her in the early days of our courtship. Sure. And she was she was asking about Arizona and she says, Don't you get sand in your house? And I was like, what? And she, sand? Don't you get sand all over your house? Like she literally thought that Arizona was like the Sahara. Right. desert you know or planet arrakis or whatever um so i've been able to educate a lot of people in new york about arizona and also i want to mention that i during the pandemic i started immediately as soon as the pandemic hit we all went into lockdown i had i had the good fortune of having my own home recording studio mm -hmm. and uh, i started doing live stream broadcasts like right away and um, eventually, when it got warm enough, I started doing live streams. I started doing concerts out in my front yard for the neighbors. Uh, and it was, a, it was a great, great experience for me to, you know, be able to entertain all my neighbors during the pandemic. These were the only people in America getting quality live music <laughs> in the summer of 2020. And then in, um, in the winter of 21, uh, my house burned down. Uh, there was an electrical fire. The porch went up. So one whole side of the house caught fire. Ooh. And I was standing out in the snow, two feet of snow, in my bare feet, because I was in the shower when the, when the house caught on fire. And so I had barely had enough time to grab my phone and, and, a, and a robe. And then I was out in the snow watching the house burn. And my first thought was, well, I have right after I called 911 and then I called my ex. 
And then um, uh, I, uh, I was standing there watching the house burn and my first thought was, my guitars. <laughs> oh God, it was just such a terrifying thought, the idea of my guitars burning. Uh, we were able to save the guitars. And anyway, it took us about a year and a half to rebuild the house. I moved back in. And as soon as I moved back in, you know, the neighbors were all coming over to shake my hand and welcome me back. And the first question is, when are you going to do another concert for the neighborhood? And so I've been looking for an opportunity and I finally found one. And so I'm going to be live streaming from my front yard on Saturday, July 8th. Okay. Uh, coming up. Coming up this summer, Saturday, July 8th, um, I will be streaming live. You're welcome to come. Bring a couple of lawn chairs, a bottle of wine, uh, some white claw, whatever it is you like to drink. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing, uh, doing this show from my front yard. I'm pretty excited. Uh, my, one of, my son is in a couple of bands. His, one of those bands is going to perform. I'm going to perform with them and solo acoustic. And then also I have uh, from New York City, uh, legendary singer songwriter Willie Nile. Oh yeah, joining us. Yeah. Uh, so Willie's going to be performing as well. So we're going to be live streaming this from my front yard Saturday, July eighth, approximately three thirty in the afternoon. I haven't really pinned down the exact time yet. It's going to depend upon when what time the sun is going down. But we'll we'll try and start about two hours before. Two and a half hours before sundown. I and uh, I'm putting anyway. that on the calendar in the article, etc. And when you get along with Willie Nile, you know you're good people. I mean, <laughs> let's face it: how many people on this planet does Pete Townsend like? And uh, Pete Townsend <laughs> likes Willie Nile, so yeah, yeah, he's pretty. He's pretty incredible as a songwriter, a performer. <laughs> Willie's Willie's is awesome, and he's a he's a friend of uh, my ex-wife. And I went to see him recently. He performed on Long Island and I was at the show and uh, I had a great, great time. So, um, yeah. So anyway, and my, my son is in a band called uh, Theo and the London Outfit. They play around Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens and whatnot. So they're going to be on the bill. Willie Nile and myself, Saturday, July 8th, approximately 3.30 in the afternoon, live stream. Well, you thank you thank for you. that info, Robin. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for the years of great, great music and looking forward to everything that's Thanks. to come, including this upcoming tour at Sugar Ray. All right. Yeah, I, yeah, we should mention that. Yeah, Fastball, Tonic, and Sugar Ray. These are my three favorite bands to tour with. Uh, so I'm good, good friends with all of them. We've got a lot of history with all three of these bands. It's a fantastic bill. Even if nobody shows up. I would want to, I would want to do that. You know, I, I just, it's so going to be so much sure. fun. And so I'm looking forward to that. And then we're playing at the Paramount on Long Island. Uh, I believe it's September 3rd. Outro.